Part of me wants to start this with a lengthy exposition on the weird mechanics of favorites, but I think it would be better to just drop the number on you. Boop. Big number, right? It's got 81 digits, its prime factorization looks like this, and I don't really care about most of that because it's not actually a number. I have fooled you, it is a Sudoku. In particular, it's a real nice Sudoku. It's really symmetric, but in order to get to that, we're going to have to figure out what it means for a Sudoku to be symmetric in the first place. In general, a thing is symmetric if I can transform it in some way without changing the essential structure of the thing. For instance, if I flip this square over, it's still a square, but if I only flip one side of the square, it bends into this weird bow tie thing. Thus, we call the full flip a symmetry of the square and the one side thing not. For the case of Sudokus, we'll first consider a group of structure preserving operations acting on the whole thing and then use that to identify which Sudokus are more and less symmetric. Now, in a Sudoku, we have a 9x9 grid split into 9 3x3 three three boxes. The digits 1 through 9 are placed in the grid such that there are no repeats in any row, column, or box. So, if I just swap two cells, we'd consider this invalid since the result wouldn't be a valid Sudoku. Instead, we must restrict ourselves to swapping entire columns within related sets of columns, and to swapping those sets themselves. Likewise, I can't just change this 1 into a 2 because it conflicts with the other 2. But, if I change all the 1s into 2s and all the 2s into 1s, basically swapping their labels, it would be structure preserving, since the result is always a valid Sudoku. To get a sense for what these transformations look like, here is a list of some that work. This actually happens to be a complete list in the sense that any structure preserving transformation is going to be generated by these. That is, it will be built out of some sequence of these operations. A trend throughout these is that they keep all the cells that quote unquote see each other together. So if two cells are in, say, the same row before a transformation, then they'll be in the same row or column after its transformation. For any group theorists out there, the full group of these transformations is isomorphic to this, the size of which is a fairly big number in its own right. Now, those can be called the symmetries of the broader set of Sudokus, but weren't we interested in the symmetries of specific Sudokus themselves? Well, now that we have a group of things that we can do to a Sudoku, we'll call a Sudoku symmetric or automorphic if some structure-preserving transformation sends that Sudoku back to itself. For instance, this Sudoku is automorphic because if I permute the digits by subtracting them from 10, and then rotate the grid by a half turn, it will result in the same grid. Now that we understand that fully, let's reconstruct our original bait and switch. Fill the top left box with numbers, preferably in a nice looking order. For the center top box, take the first box and cycle the three layers like so. Then, do the same for the next box to the right, resulting in the original box's order showing up in the top row. For the next three sets of rows below this, we'll take our first set and cycle their contents along the other axis like so. Then we repeat this last bit and we're done. For comparison, my example from a moment ago only had two automorphisms, namely the do nothing and the swap and spin. The one we just constructed has a whopping 648. In fact, up to changes by the transformations we've been mentioning, the grid is in fact unique, as attested by some posts on a forum. For that reason, it's generally called the quote-unquote most canonical grid. To see why this is the case, note that our construction baked some automorphisms into the grid. If I cycle chunks of three columns like this, and then cycle the rows like this, we're back where we started. It also had a similar sort of symmetry to our first example. If I permute the digits like this and then do a half turn, the grid remains unchanged. So, why would we care about whether a Sudoku has automorphisms? Well, the main application I'm aware of comes from the process of solving Sudoku puzzles, that is, filling in the gaps in an incomplete Sudoku. If you know in advance that an incomplete Sudoku puzzle has a unique solution, and also observe that the clues exhibit some automorphism, then this tells you that the solution must exhibit the same automorphism. This can be shown by contradiction. If the solution didn't have the same symmetry, then performing that operation on the solution 
would produce another distinct solution contradicting uniqueness. For an example of this in action, consider a puzzle with the sort of shuffle-spin symmetry we've seen twice now. Since the transformation includes a half turn, the only kinds of digit permutations that work here are those which swap four pairs of digits. This means that there must be one symbol that isn't changed by the permutation. Correspondingly, there is one square on the grid that isn't changed by rotation, namely the center. Since this square isn't moved during the rotation, its contents cannot be changed during the permutation, so the static digit must occupy the center square. The technique of finding that center digit is called Girth's Symmetrical Placement Theorem, named after a guy who posted about it on a forum once. And with that, I think I've covered all that I want to. There are a few more directions one could go, for instance, some more exotic symmetries appear if we relax the Sudoku rules to only consider Latin squares. Likewise, if you add rules, like having no repeats on a diagonal, you get a more restricted group of symmetries. But I figured these sorts of things go beyond the scope of a hashtag megafave number video. Now, I'd like to get back into making videos in general, so I'm going to recklessly promise the contents of my next one. Next time on this channel, I'll be giving a good explanation of planar ternary rings and what they have to do with projective planes other than, you know, having the same word in both names. See you then!